All right. So thanks for joining Sky and I this afternoon. Um, we're really happy to have you here. Uh, today I'll be speaking about our non-breeding grassland bird monitoring program, which I coordinate. Um, as Sky mentioned, I'm an avian ecologist with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, and I am based in Fort Collins, Colorado, but this monitoring program extends um, throughout the Chihuahuan Desert. So I'll, you'll become very familiar with that by the end of the presentation. Um, so let's get started. Um, if you're not super familiar with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, um, we just like to provide this additional slide with some information on how we approach avian conservation. Um, we use an integrated approach of science education and stewardship. So I'll be speaking mostly to the science side of things for the monitoring program, but stewardship is also pretty critical because we work with a lot of private landowners and ranchers. Um, and so it's, it's definitely of interest. And um, Sky is more integrated in the education side of things with Bird Conservancy than I am, but I've been thankful to see some of their work with banding programs. And um, occasionally when we do tagging that aligns with the winter monitoring, we can also participate in the education side of things. But um, yes, it's a really effective model and mostly I'll be speaking to science today. So um, here's our little agenda for the evening. Um, first, I'd like to provide you all with some information on my background and current work. I think people are usually pretty curious about um, the staff at Bird Conservancy and since we have usually very interesting jobs and responsibilities. So um, I'll speak to my experience working as an avian ecologist um, for the science program and um, something a little bit more unique within that it is that I work in Mexico quite a bit. And then I will speak about the monitoring program itself um, and why there is this need for the non-breeding grassland bird monitoring program to exist. So I will get into the why, who, where's, and how. And then um, I'll jump into some of our latest results from last winter from the 2021 to 2022 um, winter grassland um, bird focal species results. So kind of a set of species. And then um, we'll transition and pivot to speaking about the Baird Sparrow. So I thought it would be helpful to put everything together with a specific example of one of the focal species and um, how monitoring can help as we begin to um, understand the threats and information gaps that um, the Baird Sparrow conservation efforts have to work with. All right, so we'll get into my background and current work. So my work with birds <laughs> began when I was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota. Although you could argue that it started even before that. Um, so as you can see in that image there, I was lucky enough to gain some experience in the tropics working with macaws. And this was through an undergraduate internship. And I was at a macaw, macaw reintroduction program in Costa Rica. But um, before all of this, the reason why I was interested in macaws and parrots is because in my neighborhood in St. Paul, Minnesota, there was a parrot rescue shelter and I volunteered there. And then I started to ask questions like, why are all of these tropical birds being surrendered in the Midwest? That's kind of crazy. And I like wanted to um, learn more about how to help with wildlife trafficking and monitoring them in the wild. So anyways, that led me to this cool internship. Um, and then I also had some experience with an undergraduate research opportunities program and some field ecology coursework that I that set the foundation for my um, later to come wildlife work. When I finished um, my undergraduate degree in biology, I worked in the Peruvian Amazon as a field leader of a research center, which is run by Texas A&M University. Currently it's called the Macaw Society, but before it was the Tampopata Research Center. It's located in the Western Amazon Basin. 
Um, and there, as the crew leader, I managed large groups of people collecting data. And we collected long-term ecological data on local parrot populations and monitored riparian claylicks, which led me to become interested in disturbance ecology and just more and more of that um, research side of things with wildlife. So in that little image there, I'm um, climbing up a tree that has a rope slung over it with a single ascender climbing gear. Uh, we did this to monitor the macaw nests. So it was pretty fun. Um, when I returned to the States, I did my master's in natural resources science and management at the University of Minnesota. And I worked with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to study the effect of fire season on brushland bird communities. So in that picture there, I'm measuring the regrowth of willows. So you can see the green regrowth in contrast with the burned um, willow stems. There were a lot of really interesting bird species in the, that utilized the brushlands, including Lacan sparrow, sedge wren, common yellowthroat, which are species of greatest conservation need in Minnesota. So I learned a bit about that designation that biologists um, put into place and um, the management that they um, implement. So I developed a lot of complex models and made bird habitat management recommendations from those results. And then I took a lot of really great courses, including an avian conservation seminar and data management courses. Um, I also volunteered quite a bit um, with the ornithology lab, like the, the museum collections, um, and at the University of Minnesota's Raptor Center. And then just for fun, I banded songbirds and northern sawwet owls, um, sometimes with the ornithology class. And I still um, consult on the burn study today. So it was a really profound experience and development for me. And then after my master's, I went and had some fun and worked as a wildlife technician for Voyagers National Park. So on the bird side of things, I conducted breeding bird, uh, secret of marsh bird and loon surveys, and I assisted with eaglet banding. And then um, I also took a banding and monitoring avian productivity and survivorship course. So the MAPS program, if any of you are familiar with that through banding, um, and that was with the Institute for Bird Populations. Um, so really just getting as much of that diverse bird handling and survey experience as I could before I kind of left Minnesota. Um, but I also managed the summer's muskrat translocation program in the park. So that was really fun. And now I am also an expert on muskrats, if you ever want to know anything about them. But um, yeah, I mean, before coming to Bird Conservancy, I had a lot of diverse prior work experience. Um, and in my case, um, becoming fluent in Spanish, managing field crews, and focusing my education on avian conservation management and ecology contributed to the skills I use in my current position. And I've obviously had a lot of fun through these pictures, you can tell, um, traveling to unique places and learning about uh, complex, complex ecosystems and the birds that rely on them. So currently I'm an avian ecologist with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies and I manage our non-breeding grassland bird monitoring program in the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, so I manage funding agreements and contracts with partners in Mexico. I work with others on our um, research teams to obtain funding and I manage all aspects of field work and the program's data set. I collaborate with partners and present results to stakeholders. Um, and this often includes organizations in Mexico. So I present and provide all materials to them in Spanish. And then outside of my regular responsibilities, I do help with some of our breeding bird surveys in the Southwest. Um, I'll help with bird banding when I can fit it into my schedule and I'll just be one of the several people who can provide Spanish support if we need it for outreach events or um, translating a document or something like that. 
So there you go. That is a little bit about me. And now I will speak to the monitoring program itself. So here's our first question, why? Why do we need this non-breeding grassland bird monitoring program? Well, it might, you know, with this audience, these bird lovers here today, it might not be a surprise to hear that grassland birds are among the most rapidly declining bird, guild of birds in North America. And North America has lost 3 billion birds since the 1970s. Um, and grassland birds have experienced the steepest declines. So you can see here, um, this figure comes from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and this really important paper that came out on the decline of North American avifauna uh, pointed this out. So um, within this group of grassland birds, those that winter in the Chihuahuan Desert have also declined at a greater rate than birds that winter elsewhere. Um, ex and existing data is limited and doesn't include data from interior grasslands, but we still um, trust that these trends are indicating something quite alarming that we want to address. So to better understand these declines and their causes, um, numerous studies have investigated grassland bird demography, populations, and management effectiveness. However, most studies have been conducted on the breeding grounds. Um, and previous work suggests that conditions experienced by grassland birds on their wintering grounds may be a limiting factor for population growth, yet little research has been conducted during this part of the annual cycle. So here's our next question, who are the focal species? Well, with our surveys, we sample the entire bird community. However, the monitoring program is focused on a set of species of interest. So this includes the Baird Sparrow, Chestnut Colored Longspur, Lark Bunting, Sprague's Pippet, and Thick-Billed Longspur. And um, some of these focal species are also identified by our funders. So a grant is presented and they have already identified, for example, Chestnut Colored Longspur and Sprague's Pippet. Um, and so we, because we collect data on all species detected, um, we're confident that we could provide them with information on their focal species and then in addition, any other grassland species of interest that perhaps other um, stakeholders want information on and even just ourselves, what we want information on. You know, the lark bunting is the state bird of Colorado, so we want to know what's going on with them. Um, and here in some of these pictures, you might already start to get a sense of the whole like non-breeding and wintering bird challenges. Um, some of these birds are more brightly colored in the during the breeding season. So our lark bunting here is not going to be so contrastingly black and white on their wintering grounds. Um, and for some of the long spurs too, that's the case. So some tricks for telling the chestnut colored and thick-billed long spurs apart is that um, for the Chestnut club longs for their tail has a mostly white with a small black triangle. And then the thick billed longs for um, their tail will have an inverted T on the end. And they also have a uh, have reddish wing coverts that you can sometimes pick up on. Um, and one other element here that you're able to see with the image of the chestnut colored long spur is that some of these birds form large flocks on their wintering grounds. So um, that's the case for both long spurs. Um, although a lot of the time we detect thick billed long spurs in smaller numbers mixed in with the chestnut colored flocks, um, but long, lark buntings will also form large flocks. We're already getting into some identification. <laughs> All right, here's our other who, not who birds, but who people. So who monitors? So since the program began in 2019, we've had several universities and nonprofits in the US and Mexico participate. Um, in addition to the bird conservancy crews conducting surveys, graduate students with their technicians from the Borderlands Research Institute at Sol Ross State University will survey in Texas. And then Bird Conservancy um, will contract an organization in Mexico to do the bulk of those surveys. So this last winter, it was 
Ishak, Especie Sociedad y Habitat, and they, they conducted many surveys on ranches within our sustainable grazing network. Um, I'll speak a little bit to that later on. And for many years prior, we contracted IMC. So that's Investigación, Manejo y Conservación. And then we also have worked closely with Pronatura Nor Noreste in Mexico. We set them up with our design and provide them with training. Um, and they have partnered with the Turtle Conservancy and UANL, Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León. Um, the Turtle Conservancy is an interesting partnership because um, they're located in on some ranches that they want to survey, and they conduct uh, surveys to track the bulls and tortoise. Um, and they wanted to see if our design would allow them to not only track grassland birds but also the tortoise. So still in progress. It, they've they've been doing it for two years. So hopefully they're um, able to learn about. Um, both types of animals. <laughs> um, and then additionally, Audubon, New Mexico, and then in Juarez, the university um, in Durango um, has also participated in monitoring. So it's a big group of people um, out on the ground. And then who provides funding? So on the US side of things, our funding comes from Texas Parks and Wildlife and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And then in Mexico, our work is funded by the Knobloch Family Foundation. So thank you to those funders. Um, this critical work is very much dependent on your support. All right, where do we monitor? So here is an example map of the Chihuahuan Desert. You know, um, depending on how you exactly define it, I think that there are different maps you could go off of, but this one shows um, um, topography, which can be really helpful, and some of the states. So within the US, the Chihuahuan Desert can be found within Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, far west Texas. Um, sometimes you just say west Texas, then Texans will think you're like not even going past Del Rio or something. <laughs> so you have to say far west Texas. And then in Mexico, um, the states include Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo Leon, Durango, Zacatecas, and San Luis Potosí. And as you can tell, it's a very extensive region. Um, and therefore, there are a lot of diverse habitat types within the Chihuahua Desert, um, even within grassland ecosystems identified by experts. So here are some examples of different um, vegetative cover types, the amount of cover that we see, uh, different types of terrain and soil. And so um, it's a pretty incredible part of North America if you haven't ever been able to visit. And um, yeah, hopefully this gives you a sense of how diverse it could be and how um, we're already starting to learn a lot about how birds select for the different features on the landscape that's so diverse that they require. So in order to refine our focus, um, we consulted with partners that are based in the region and, to determine where exactly we would sample. And we primarily use two systems. So the first one is the grassland, um, grassland priority conservation areas um, designation. So that's the green here overlaying um, North America. And in Texas, our partners actually refined those green areas. They said, you know, actually based on our expertise, we'd like to um, alter these shapes a little bit. We also used the bird conservation regions, um, which were developed by the North American Bird Conservation Initiative. And so in the U.S. and Mexico, or well, in the U.S. side, we used the Chihuahuan Desert region. So this is region 35, if later in other maps you see that number. And then we also, in Mexico, used the Chihuahuan Desert region in addition to the Sierra Madre Occidental region, which is number 34. So this is a, um, 
kind of a general concept map of where we survey to try to capture the extent of these grassland birds on their wintering grounds. Um, as you can see, if we were to only survey within the red, so bird cons conservation region 35 in Mexico, then we would miss some of the um, grassland priority conservation areas, which are indicated by the diagonal lines. So that's why we included the BCR region 34 as well. Um, and we have not obtained funding to survey in Arizona yet, but we are only focused on BCR 35 in the US, which doesn't cover much of Arizona. Um, so there's just kind of different philosophies on those BCRs and how you would utilize them. And in the US, it seemed to align more with our strategy to just do the one. Um, yeah, so these lands include state, federal, um, including military bases and a lot of private land. Um, and as I move forward and I speak to the areas of, of study, I'll um, refer to them as strata. And so for the regional level, we focused on four uh, strata. We had grasslands and potential grasslands inside and outside GPCAs, the Grassland Priority Conservation Areas. And we included potential grasslands so that we wouldn't miss birds that occupy habitat with suboptimal conditions or areas that may be restored to grasslands over time. Um, we also used, we also um, surveyed ranches as well. So we had some strata that were at the ranch level, but since this map is so zoomed out, you wouldn't be able to see any of those small ranches. Um, and so, yeah, we surveyed both ranch and regional level strata in both countries. Um, and some of the ranches were participating in studies on shrub reduction. So they had like a treatment site and a control site. Um, and there was a lot of interest in comparing ranch level data to regional level data by the, the ranchers and um, people participating in ranch management. And in Mexico, um, we surveyed a lot of ejidos, which are communal land. So how do we monitor? Um, here is a breakdown of the stages we, we go through to select um, a monitoring survey grid, essentially. So we have um, put into place a spatially balanced sampling design. Um, if you wanna just pretend like any of that big, um, green area in the map of the Chihuahuan Desert is fair game. And we have, yes, identified certain strata within that, but let's just say anywhere in there you could potentially survey. Um, we would overlay a one kilometer square grid over that area. And then each grid, um, each individual grid cell is assigned a value. So like a ranking order, um, then moving forward, we would randomly select those grid cells um, based on the number or rank that was assigned. And in the end, um, we would select a single grid cell for an observer to go out and survey. So hopefully you guys can see this video, but here is what it looks like for somebody to walk a line transect, and they're gonna be walking three within a single grid in one morning. So they'll walk at a certain pace and stop and scan. When they see a bird, they will use a rangefinder to get a distance. Um, what is the distance of that bird perpendicular to the line transect? And they'll record that, um, other important information, and then continue on with the survey. Um, so once they've walked all three transects collecting bird data, um, recording all the species again, um, as I mentioned previously, then they'll basically turn around, walk the same transects and record habitat data. So we'll get um, really high quality vegetation data as well. Um, and so kind of along these lines we'll, and ste stepping back a little bit, well, um, how do we monitor? Well, we also have to prepare people and provide really extensive trainings in order for them to go out and walk those grid cells and they would be walking the grid cells independently. So 
it's not uh, that people go out in teams or anything. So they need to be well versed in bird and plant ID and um, nomenclature. They also need to feel comfortable navigating independently and estimating um, kind of nebulous, challenging things like the bird um, distance, especially if it's not perpendicular to the line and estimating plant cover visually, which is always a challenge. So in that bottom left corner, you can see as, we, as we're practicing, we laid out some tape measures to try to put some context to a vegetation plot and then determine you know, like how much shrub cover is in here and how much bare ground is exposed. Um, so it takes a lot of people to uh, go out and do all these surveys. So we'll have a lot of fun um, meeting up for you know like a week or so at a time to do these trainings. And then a big element of monitoring also is working in bilingual settings. So trainings will be um, typically at this point, they've been conducted first, um, or rather it was second this year, second in the US and first we had our training in Mexico. So we're just speaking in either English or Spanish at each training, but there have been times um, when it's a mixed group of people. So we have to be translating for one another and all that. So um, yeah, we've got our data sheets and all of our materials in both languages. And here's just a table of some example vocabulary that is specific to the monitoring and specific to the region. Um, it's been really fun for me to learn more of that dialect in Northern Mexico. So let's take a look at some of our results from this last winter. Um, and actually here to provide some context, um, I've got some of our totals from the previous winters as well. So in our first ever season in 2019, we only surveyed a few ranches in Texas. So we only did 77 of those grid cells. Um, then moving forward, we did a regional effort and bumped up our numbers. In the winter of 2020, 2021, we weren't able to do any reg regional surveys because of COVID, but we did start to um, monitor in Mexico on us, our ranches. These were ranches with the sustainable grazing network that for Conservancy has um, been growing for many, many years. And it works closely with ranchers to um, create optimal grassland conditions for grassland birds and as well as um, for cattle ranching. And um, I'd like to just point out too that what I'm speaking to today is our current monitoring program. Bird Conservancy has had past monitoring programs under different designs. And so Mexico, um, we have surveyed in Mexico and monitored in Mexico in the past, just under a different design kind of before my, my time here. So I'm just speaking to the current program. You could argue that we've done a lot more monitoring in Mexico, not just starting in 2020, for sure. And then um, this last winter, we were able to do regional surveys and really bumped up our effort. So we did a total of 613 grids, which was 927 miles, which I looked it up. <laughs> I just happened to see how far is Fort Collins, Colorado from Chihuahua, Mexico. And it's basically that, it's 928 miles. So pretty impressive. So with our spatially balanced survey design, we can produce density estimates, which is the number of individuals of a species per unit area. And I pulled out a few of our um, grassland local species. So lark bunting, chestnut colored longspur, spikes pipit, thick billed longspur. These are the regional level surveys. So um, from left to right, we have grasslands inside priority areas and outside priority areas. And then we have potential grasslands inside priority areas and outside priority areas. So I'm just gonna pick, up, pick out a few patterns. Um, so in Texas, um, these are Texas regional estimates. It looked like that all of our species were detected inside the GPCAs, the grassland priority conservation areas, and none were detected outside. And if you remember in Texas, um, those GPCAs were informed by some of our partner organizations and specialists. So they did a good job. <laughs> um, 
Then for New Mexico regional density estimates looking at the same species, it was a bit more of a mixed bag. So unlike in Texas, three of the four species were detected inside those GPCAs um, and all were detected outside the GPCAs. So perhaps um, those GPCAs could have been refined, they could have been um, even expanded a little bit more to include what apparently seems to be some important habitat for grassland specialists. Um, except for the Sprague's pipit, all species were detected in the potential grasslands too. Um, so that's also interesting. Um, yeah, so I think maybe I missed this in the previous slide, but I did star in the corner there that both potential grasslands and the GPCAs were important for the Texas estimates. But here in New Mexico, I don't know if the GPCAs are really telling us a ton of information necessarily for these species at least, um, um, but the potential grasslands seem to be a place where you could find some of these grassland specialists. So then for our ranch level estimates, remember we had the two different types, regional and ranch, um, we also produced um, some data. I got the same species here again. If you look along the x-axis, some of the ranch names will have TRT. That'll be for if they had a treatment, um, that would be a, to reduce shrub cover. And there are also some with CTRL for a control. So we're not really able to do a lot of comparing here, um, but that could be said with the regional as well. I think the more data collect, the more patterns we're gonna tease out. Um, but what I wanna do is just go through a few patterns for the, the different species. So lark buntings um, were the only species detected in the Culberson Ranch. Um, and they were detected in really large flocks. And I remember this, this landowner calling me and telling me there are huge flocks of birds on my ranch this year that aren't usually so impressive. And it turned out it was the lark buntings. Um, they were also detected on one of the treatment ranches and on a reference ranch with high quality grasslands. For Sprague's pipit, they were not detected on many ranches, but they were detected on one that we know has a really healthy prairie dog colony. That's the McKnight control um, ranch strata. And then they were detected on MIMS as well, which is also a reference ranch with high quality grassland. And for the long spurs, they were generally detected in the same ranches. And we often do observe the thick billed long spur in chestnut colored long spur flocks. So this aligns with those observations. Well, thanks for making it through me with some of those um, preliminary results. I am gonna move on to an example of the Baird Sparrow. So I just thought to put things into perspective, it would Can be- Can I pause you real quick, Annie? Oh yeah, go ahead. We just had one question about the meaning of treatments in the previous slide. Yeah. Does that mean herbicides? What, what kind of treatments are you talking about? Yeah, that's a great question because there are a lot of different ways that shrub, shrubs can be treated or managed. And so this is done by Texas Parks and Wildlife and they're primarily treating mesquite um, and other invasive like monoculture shrubs by applying herbicide so they're not mechanically removing the shrubs um, and I recently saw a presentation that they gave on this and I was wondering if they thought that um, the 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 herbicide treatment was really enough because one of the problems with the standing shrubs is that it attracts avian predators like loggerhead shrikes and raptors to perch. And so even if the shrubs are dead, if they're still there, they could, you know, allow for predators to occupy the area. So, you know, it's not anything that they or we have looked at, but um, yeah, that is the treatment that they apply. And um, I'd be curious if there are future stages um, they might take that would allow us to, to look at this in more detail. OK, 
Great. Well, hopefully that answers your question and I'll continue and we can chat again at the very end if we need to. So yeah, I just thought uh, to put things into perspective, it would be helpful to speak about a specific focal species, the Baird Sparrow. So I didn't include the Baird Sparrow density estimate results yet. Um, and just so we all know what we're talking about, I wanted to just provide some basic identification um, information. So the Baird Sparrow exhibits similar plumage in the summer and winter and between males and females. But during the winter, um, males do not sing. So we rely primarily on visual cues. So um, here are several of those. I'm not gonna read them all out loud, but it's a pretty handsome little sparrow. <laughs> and um, when we do our surveys, um, we're essentially walking so that we flush up birds like the Baird Sparrow that are hiding out and running on the ground, because they tend to do that instead of um, flying off um, you know, very high up. When they do get flushed, they'll fly and then they'll dive down into the grasses like a few feet away from you. So it's really important to be familiar with these features so that if you get a, a glimpse at something, you know, like the ochre head or the whiter, um, white outer rectrices, then you might get lucky and be able to confidently ID it. <laughs> um, and just for fun, so this is a group of sparrows that we caught in Hanos, Chihuahua on a ranch that has been managed by the Nature Conservancy. It has bison, so it's really high quality grasslands. And this was in one, one attempt at capturing grassland birds. So um, as you can see, they're similar in different ways. And especially if you were to be out in the field, walking along and flushing any one of these species up, it could be pretty hard to tell them apart. <laughs> so first up, we have a Baird Sparrow, then the Cass and Sparrow one, distinguishing features, they have a very long tail, Savannah Sparrow, and then Grasshopper Sparrow. Those two have really stubby tails like the Baird Sparrow. So Centronix Bairdii um, is a grassland specialist. And um, here's a pretty general map, but they um, occupy the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert um, and are disturbance associated because they evolved with disturbance events such as extreme drought and rainfall, fire, and migratory bison herds. Um, that's what maintained the open grasslands. Um, currently, there's approximately 3.4 million individuals um, in North America. And go over a bit on their full annual cycle um, ecology here, but I might speed things up just so we have enough time for questions. So um, their breeding range includes mixed grass prairies. Um, and again, due to those disturbance events and changes between breeding seasons and conditions, they are considered highly nomadic and exhibit low site fidelity. Um, we do have an example of what one might sing during the breeding season, even though we're not really gonna hear this during the wintering monitoring. There you go. All right, so then they, um, they start to head south in the fall, um, starting as early as August, and they migrate approximately 2,000 2, miles. Um, and then in winter, they occupy the semi-desert grasslands of the southwestern US. We've already talked a bit about that range in the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, and they do experience low survival in the winter. Um, a lot of this is due to that dep depredation by um, avian predators. And then when conditions are favorable in late February, they'll return north. So um, again, now you're familiar with this image. We know that grassland birds are in decline. In relation to that, the Baird Sparrow has declined at a rate of 65.2% since the 70s. Um, and they have a pretty narrow wintering, wintering range. So about half of the population overwinters 
in the Cuchilla de las Arcas GPCA, a grass and priority conservation area in Mexico. Um, and they do not have a federal conservation status, but in, in either the US or Mexico, but they are listed as a, um, a species of priority conservation in several states. Um, habitat loss, degradation, and fragmentation is the greatest threat to the Baird Sparrow, um, with almost 70% of grasslands being lost to agricultural conversion. And then along with that, with shrub encroachment, predation can increase, as I've mentioned before. So here's an example of an area in northern Mexico that has experienced really high agricultural conservation conversion rates, excuse me, to center pivot agriculture. Um, and this is, these are images between 2006 and 2011. Um, so imagine what has happened since then, <laughs> quite a bit more. Um, additional threats uh, include nest parasitism. So unfortunately, the brown-headed brown cowbird especially targets the Baird Sparrow. Um, pesticides, which is going to um, um, reduce their feeding or food supply of insects, especially during um, critical times in the breeding season. And then extreme weather events and climate change, especially on their wintering grounds, is um, going to affect their survival. So um, we know that like really extreme cold events can um, wipe out a lot of these grassland, um, small grassland birds, not just the Barrett's bear, but other um, small bodied birds. So some research needs include um, establishing regional population estimates and understanding their response to management. So here I have some examples of information either in the literature or on um, uh, in public access data sets on the Baird Sparrow that show there's a really big lack of information on Baird Sparrow trends and current numbers, especially on their wintering grounds. So how can we effectively um, conserve and manage them without having numbers, even baseline numbers on what the population is? So that's where our monitoring program has stepped in. And here are some results from this last season on the Baird Sparrow. So I have both of the US states up here, New Mexico and Texas, um, density um, on the y-axis and then the same set of grassland strata along the x-axis. Um, and let's see, we pick out. So here we were seeing that density is much higher in Texas and that does align with some of the um, information that exists even though the data that exists does not include interior grasslands and it is somewhat limited. Um, and we, there is this strong interest to collect more data, but it does align with that, that we're seeing more, more Baird Sparrows in Texas. Um, we also didn't detect any Baird Sparrows in the potential grasslands in New Mexico. So however we defined grasslands seem to align with um, what they seek out um, when they need to occupy areas in New Mexico. For the Texas ranch estimates, um, we were also able to look at the same ranches that we looked at earlier with, but with the Baird Sparrow here. So interestingly enough, Baird Sparrows were not detected on those shrub reduction treatment sites, but they were detected on the controls. So yes, perhaps more information on what exactly those treatments um, entail would be informative here. Uh, they were detected on the three reference ranches that exhibit high quality grasslands. They were not detected on the Culberson Ranch, but yeah, those three, MIMS, MIMS New and Martha, have really high quality grasslands. So just a few more points here. Um, in addition to that, the research needs that we're addressing, there are also some conservation strategies that grassland conservationists can be implementing to address the decline of the Baird Sparrow and other grassland specialists. Um, so in spite of information gaps, we know that maintaining and reducing the degradation of remaining grasslands benefits Baird Sparrows and other species, and it should remain an urgent priority. 
And then population estimates can be improved by um, aligning a, our rigorous monitoring effort with um, the MODIS wildlife network throughout the region. So um, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies has a MODIS program. I encourage you to look into it. Um, if you are not very familiar, I won't get into it today, but it's a wildlife tracking program that can complement um, studies like monitoring or demographics or even the effect of management. And here in this image in the left-hand corner, we had our field crew um, look at, or, or rather get a little lesson on the installation of a MODIS tower on one of the ranches that we were monitoring this winter. Um, we also delete, believe that landowner engagement is really critical in not only conserving the Baird Sparrow, but obviously all of these other grassland specialists. And so um, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies has a sustainable grazing network in Northern Mexico. And in a few weeks time, we're actually going down to Chihuahua to um, host a cattle rancher meeting to continue to grow the network and provide people with information um, they'll be presenting on some of the results of the bird monitoring as well. So all of these efforts can hopefully stabilize and increase and maintain the population of the special Baird Sparrow and a lot of our other treasured um, grassland specialists in North America. So thank you so much. Um, that's it for my presentation. Sky, hopefully we have a few minutes left for questions. Sorry went over a little bit, but. No problem. I think that was excellent. Uh, if anybody needs to duck out because they have other things happening, please feel free. But otherwise, uh, you are now welcome to unmute yourself. I see um, a question we've just received in the chat as well. Um, from Karen, during monitoring, do you record all species or just the focal one? Yeah, so we record all species, yep. Um, and for those density estimates on the graphs, those are produced when we have enough data of the species. So if you, uh, for example, detected like five golden eagles throughout the entire season, we probably wouldn't be able to produce density estimates on that. We are still going to record the golden eagles we see, but um, it really comes down to getting enough data for the focal species, um, which we've been successful at so far. That makes sense. And another question, what do you think is the primary reason for the decline in grassland birds? A pretty big question. <laughs> yeah, it is a pretty critical question. I, I mean, I think habitat loss and fragmentation is a big one, um, but perhaps that in addition to extreme drought could, could be arguably um, the biggest threat because although I'm not based in Chihuahua, that's or you know the Chihuahuan Desert region. That's constantly what we're hearing from our partners who live in the area. They're always praying for rain and the grass is dry and they're having to get really creative in order for their cattle to have enough sustenance. Um, so you know the grassland birds are also experiencing that severe drought that um, you know hits them hard within the little grasslands that are remaining. That makes a lot of sense. And Karen also brings up the big wildfires in New Mexico are only gonna exacerbate these problems. Yeah, definitely. Any other questions before we wrap up? All right, I think that about does it. I'm going to stop the recording now.